great. And for the first uh, talk of the second session today, we're very happy to have Daniel Harlow from MIT that'll tell us about global symmetry, Euclidean gravity, and the black hole information paradox. Daniel, floor is all yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Alex, and thanks to the organizers for uh, um, setting up this conference and also for inviting me to speak. It looks like it's going to be a fun week, although I guess on top of everything else going on in the middle of the semester, it'll also be a busy week. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, this combination of things, global symmetry, Euclidean gravity, and the black hole information problem. And this will be based on a paper um, that Edgar Shigulian and I uh, just put out last week. Um, so, uh, so, OK, let's start with global symmetry. So this idea that there are no global symmetries in quantum gravity goes back a long way. Um, for example, Banks and Dixon observed it already as a statement about continuous global symmetries from the point of view of the perturbative world sheet. Um, there were comments in this paper of Giddings and Strominger about uh, uh, Euclidean wormholes leading to possible global symmetry violations. Similar remarks in this paper by Kalish, Linde, Linde, and Susskind. Um, I think the rough idea is that um, you can destroy global symmetry charge by throwing it into a black hole. That's kind of the zeroth order argument that quantum gravity should violate global symmetry. Um, but so far, to turn that into an actual argument, um, you know, which is not obvious, right? Like, why doesn't the black hole just keep the global charge then, right? Like, you know, to, so to turn it into an actual argument, um, it's been necessary either to restrict to continuous global symmetries, um, in which case there's an argument which is most nicely explained in this paper of Banks and Seiberg. Um, basically, you make a big black hole, uh, then you throw something charged into it, you let it evaporate, and eventually the information about the charge is just too much for the Bekenstein Hawking entropy to accommodate. Um, or uh, you can use um, ADS CFT, which uh, I and uh, Hiroshi Oguri did a couple of years ago. But you somehow you have to somehow restrict things or make further assumptions. So, uh, in particular, um, ADS CFT is really too strong of, of of an assumption, right? Like we, uh, after all, we don't think that our universe has a negative cosmological constant, and we would hope that the idea that um, there are no global symmetries applies to our universe as well. Um, but on the other hand, there needs to be some kind of assumption that you make if you want to get this result that there are no global symmetries. Um, and in fact, we'll, to make that clear, we'll see in a sec that uh, in sufficiently low dimensions, there are theories of quantum gravity that have global symmetries. So, so any argument that there aren't global symmetries will somehow have to, to rule out these theories you know, by fiat, sort of make assumptions that are strong enough to exclude these theories. Um, so what I'm gonna to try to do in this talk is convince you um, of a proposal that Edgar and I made, which is uh, what we view as a sort of natural sufficient condition um, to exclude global symmetries in quantum gravity. Um, so uh, it's, I can't quite say it's necessary because you could always, you know, e even in these lower dimensional examples, just by accident, you could not have any global symmetries, right? So, um, but somehow, you know, just because you happen to not have them, but so, you know, to have for it to have a principled reason not to have them, um, uh, we're giving a proposal for what we think the criterion is. And the idea is, uh, you know, in the context of this conference, maybe almost obvious, um, so we want to say that any theory of quantum gravity in which black hole evaporation is a unitary process um, that moreover is consistent with the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy formula, um, or more generally the Wald formula, uh, then there cannot be any global symmetries. Um, so we can't prove this because it's, it's kind of too general of a statement to prove. We don't know enough about quantum gravity to try to prove something like this, um, but I'm going to give you two kinds of evidence. Uh, so the first is that we'll see that in the cases where we can construct quantum gravity theories with global symmetry, um, this assumption is going to be violated. So um, either the theories just won't have black holes at all, um, or if they have black holes, um, they might evaporate unitarily, but they won't uh, have an entropy which is consistent with the Bekenstein-Hawking or, or the Wall formula. Um, so that's kind of one uh, sort of piece of evidence. Um, the other piece is that we'll show that um, 
if you assume a bit more, so if you, or maybe a lot more, I don't know, if you, if you assume that the page curve um, calculations of Pennington and Almeri, Engelhardt, Merrill, and Maxfield are valid, um, then actually that's also sufficient to kind of upgrade um, my argument with Rossi from a couple of years ago um, to exclude the possibility of global symmetry in any such theory. Um, so, so that's kind of closer to a proof, but it, it's still not quite a proof, right? Because somehow what it, what it does is it kind of reduces uh, the conjecture to the statement that um, what happens in these papers is kind of the only way to be unitary and be compatible with the Bekenstein Hawking formula, which I, which I think maybe is somehow plausible, but I wouldn't say that that's a statement that I know is true. Um, all right, so let's start with the first thinking about the simple examples so that we see that some assumption is necessary. So we're gonna start out very trivially um, with the particle world line theory. So it's just the theory of a single relativistic particle moving in Minkowski space. Um, if I write it in terms of the proper time, it doesn't look very gravitational, but I can integrate in a dynamical metric and then it just looks, it looks like a zero plus one theory of uh, matter fields x mu, the embedding coordinates of the particle, um, interacting with a, a zero plus one dimensional metric GTT. Um, uh, similarly, um, you can do the string world sheet. So here's the Polykov action. It's a two-dimensional theory of matter fields interacting with the two-dimensional metric. Uh, and the point is that both of these theories have a global symmetry, which is just target space Poincaré symmetry. So you can, uh, you can rotate the embedding coordinates uh, in the target space. And from the point of view of uh, the zero plus one or one plus one dimensional theory, that's a global symmetry. Um, and uh, well, okay, neither of these theories has black holes, at least not in any sense, which seems natural to me. Um, and uh, so our proposal allows these theories to have global symmetries and in fact they do. Okay. Now, Okay, those are kind of silly because they don't even have black holes and okay, I mean, yeah, there's a dynamical metric, but is it really quantum gravity? I don't know. Um, so uh, a somewhat more interesting set of examples is what you get if you take the ADS version of Jakeev Teitelboim gravity, uh, a couple to conformal matter. So this is Jakeev Teitelboim action, you have the dynamical dilt on phi, you have a dynamical metric G. Uh, and then you take an arbitrary matter CFT, or actually not quite arbitrary. I want it to be non-chiral, so C equals C right, but other than that, arbitrary. Um, and then you, you couple it to the dynamic trick, but importantly, you don't um, copy it, couple it to the dilaton. Um, so this is a renormalizable theory of quantum gravity. Um, and uh, so after, so it can, it can be constructed non by canonical quantization, and moreover, um, you can solve it uh, via a vial transformation to flat space. So by solve, I mean, you can solve the gravity sector. I mean, the matter CFT might be a strongly coupled CFT, so you can't solve that, but you can express uh, all observables just in terms of the flat correlators uh, matter CFT, which you uh, may not be able to compute, um, but at least you've kind of, you can solve the gravity part of it. Um, and so in particular, um, if you have a global symmetry of this matter CFT, at least as long as it doesn't have a mixed anomaly with gravity. Um, so for example, like you could think about uh, taking the matter CFT to be M free Dirac fermions, and then there's a UN uh, flavor symmetry, um, then that symmetry survives canonical quantization and it becomes an exact global symmetry of the quantum gravity theory. Um, and unlike the previous two examples, um, this theory does have black hole solutions, at least in some sense. Um, so it's kind of more maybe at first surprising that you can have a theory like this that has, has both black holes and has a, has a global symmetry. Um, on the other hand, though, we'll see in a little bit that although it has black holes, um, their entropy is infinite. It, it, it works a bit, you know, if you're old enough uh, to remember the CGHS or RST models, it works a bit like that. So. Um, although this theory has black hole solutions, somehow you should really think of it as a theory with remnants um, so that uh, the black hole's uh, entropy really is sort of infinite instead of being given by uh, the 2D analog of the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. 
Um, and so that's again why, um, why this theory is allowed to have a global symmetry without violating our proposal. Um, now, I just wanna make an aside because, uh, well, we'll come back to it at the end of the talk, but I wanna say a little bit now. So, so in these examples, um, because of renormalizability, um, canonical quantization gives you a well-defined quantum mechanical theory. Um, and uh, you can think about it in the path integral formulation if you want to. Um, and uh, in the Lorenzian path integral formula, you, formulation of this th these theories, you, you sum only over globally hyperbolic topologies. Those are what are produced by canonical quantization. Um, now, you may, for whatever reason, and we'll discuss it more later in the talk, um, want to include more topologies than just the globally hyperbolic ones. You might want to, uh, for example, include arbitrary topologies, um, such as what you would get by analytically continuing from Euclidean signature. Um, so you can try to do that, but you have to add them by hand. They don't come out of canonical quantization. And, um, and if you do add them, then there's no guarantee that what you get will either be well-defined or even be quantum mechanics at all. It might just be something different. Um, and in fact, that's clear in JT. So first let's even not have the matter CFT. Let's just think about pure gravity. Um, say with two asymptotic ADS boundaries. So if you do canonical quantization, that theory is exactly solvable and it's equivalent to the Liouville quantum mechanics, just the, the quantum mechanics of a particle moving in an exponential potential. Um, well, if you try to make sense of the Euclidean quote quantization, um, then you actually don't get a quantum theory. You get some average over random Hamiltonians. Um, and that's okay because you started from something other than canonical quantization, so you don't have to get quantum mechanics. If you started with canonical quantization, you have to get quantum mechanics. Um, if, you, uh, if you try to do the Euclidean quantization, um, including the conformal matter, um, then it's even in some sense worse because it's just divergent. Uh, there are sort of pinching divergences at higher genus, uh, so the theory is not well-defined by itself. Um, it somehow needs some UV completion, whereas kind of the whole point of having well-defined examples here was that due to renormalizability, we could be sure that we didn't need any further UV completion. Um, so, uh, so the point of view which I'm gonna take and which I'll defend further at the end of the talk is that um, Euclidean gravity path integral is only compatible with quantum mechanics um, in theories where the low energy gravity theory really should be thought of as as emerging from some holographic UV completion and not as being, not as being a complete theory by itself. Um, so for now, we'll just uh, take that as an assumption and then I'll, I'll try to justify this point of view um, at the end of the talk. Okay, now I wanna give one more example with global symmetry before we um, move on. So the last example will be what I'll call the oriented version of pure Einstein gravity in two plus one dimensions, um, which I'll take to have a negative cosmological constant. So here's the action. So you can also try to do a Euclidean quantization. I would say it's still not clear um, how you're supposed to think about that or what it means, although it's certainly interesting to think about, um, but definitely nothing can stop you from doing canonical quantization of this theory, it's renormalizable. Um, and so for example, that was studied in, in these two papers, uh, by one by Alex and then one by Kim and Massimo. Um, in 2015. Um, now, what I mean by the oriented version is I mean the version where we include only spatial topology, where we include only oriented spatial topology. So when you write down this action, uh, even so in canonical quantization, the, the topology of space is always R times sigma, where sigma is some spatial manifold. In the oriented version, we require sigma to be an oriented manifold. Um, and with that requirement, um, parity should be viewed as a global symmetry of this theory. So this is another example of a quantum gravity theory with a global symmetry, which is parity. Um, on the other hand, you could also include unoriented spatial manifolds, and that would be um, that would that's essentially the same as gauging parity. Um, so if you know string theory, this is a bit like the difference between the oriented and the unoriented string on the world sheet. So um, the the oriented string has world sheet parity as the global symmetry and the unoriented string has world sheet parity as the, as the gauge symmetry. Um, and so this theory also, you know, it does have a black hole solution. So in that, that sense, it's more interesting than the, the world line or the world sheet theories. 
Um, but again, actually, it's black holes have infinite entropy. Um, one way to think about it is that you can put as many handles as you want behind the horizon and still get a, a microstate with one asymptotic boundary. Um, and moreover, there are, also, there are also divergences associated to trying to quantize the moduli space of such solutions. Um, so again, this uh, you know, is in some sense a well-defined theory of quantum gravity, it has a global symmetry, has black hole solutions, but it, it's, its black holes kind of don't behave in the way that we would like, uh, certainly the way that our proposal requires. So, so, uh, so from our point of view, it's okay if it has a global symmetry. Um, okay. Now, let's move on. Um, or actually, why don't I first stop and ask if there are any questions? Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Maybe if there are sort of more high level conceptual questions, they can wait till the discussion at the end, but I can't tell if there are raised hands. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you know so far there aren't. Okay, sounds good. Um, so, uh, oh, now Raghu has a question. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, okay. you, you asked for it. Sure. Uh, yeah, Raghu. Hi, uh, yes, Daniel, I have a question. Did, um, I'm just trying to understand this infinite uh, entropy thing in JT gravity. Oh yeah. Are you ignoring phi naught? Uh, no, I'm not. So I'll explain that in the next section. So you'll see you'll see exactly what I mean in a minute. Uh, phi naught is finite for me. Um, okay. Um, so uh, the fact that the actions I just discussed could be unambiguously quantized um, leading to a well-defined theory of quantum gravity relied on renormalizability, which is, is certainly not a property of Einstein gravity in three plus one dimensions. Okay. Um, so, so there's not going to be an obvious example like these lower dimensional ones in three plus one dimensions. Um, on the other hand, you could, you could hope for some kind of UV fixed point of Einstein gravity, which is usually called asymptotic safety. Um, and it's also what uh, the loop quantum gravity people are hoping for. Um, and my expectation, so when I say we here, I mean me and maybe Edgar, but I don't necessarily intend to speak for everyone. So if this made sense, um, we expect that um, it would allow global symmetries. You know, if there's, a, if there's a conformal fixed point for gravity, you know, with the Lagrangian formulation in three plus one dimensions, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't allow global symmetries. Um, uh, and I would also expect it to violate the Bekenstein Hawking formula, um, as the examples we just discussed did. Um, and I'll, I'll, as I'll explain more for JT in a minute. Um, you know, but on the other hand, there's no evidence um, for asymptotic safety currently. And to some extent, there's evidence against it, although I don't know in detail what to make of that. Um, but instead, what I do know is that all the theories of quantum gravity in three plus one dimensions, which are UV complete that we currently know about come from string theory. Um, and those that we understand non-perturbatively are all holographic. Um, so their fundamental description lives in a lower number of space-time dimensions at some asymptotic boundary. Um, and, in, and in these theories, in, in every case where we've been able to check, the bekenstein hawking formula is correct. Okay, so somehow this suggests that gra you know, gravity in three plus one dimensions li is likely to work in a different way than what happened in these weird lower dimensional examples, um, which, which is good because we do want to, for example, have gravity be constraining in three plus one dimensions. So it would be in some sense disappointing if, if you could have global symmetries just based on some you know, UV at complete asymptotic safety. Um, so uh, of course the best understood example of holography is the ADF-CFT correspondence, um, which, uh, well, one and and uh, you know one of our favorite parts of the ADS-CFT correspondence, and indeed one of the main topics of this conference, is this quantum extremal surface formula. Uh, so I drew here. I drew a picture of an entanglement wedge and a quantum extremal surface, and here I wrote the formula. But I'm not going to try to explain the formula to you because hopefully, if you're at this conference, you know about the quantum extremal surface formula. Um, I'll just mention though that it does as a consequence imply entanglement wedge reconstruction, which is the statement that any operator in this bulk entanglement wedge WR can be represented as an operator um, on the boundary here, uh, R uh, in the dual CFT, um, you know, modulo some technical caveats, which I won't get into. Now, over the last decade, um, it's gradually been realized that um, there's something much more general 
and robust to this quantum extremal surface formula than, than its sort of initial incarnation introduced by Ruta Kanagi and then gradually developed by these people. Um, in particular, you can apply um, the, the quantum extremal surface formula to systems that are more general than just some piece of a holographic CFT. Uh, so maybe the first inclination of that was in the paper of Swingle back in 2009, where he showed that general tensor network constructions of many body quantum states um, obey some kind of QES formula, although in general for him it's just an inequality. Um, and then later it was realized that in more special tensor networks it really holds as an equality. Um, it was also, you know, and again, where these are, you know, there's nothing CFT or strong coupling or anything necessarily about these networks, right? They're just, uh, you know, many body quantum systems. Um, uh, more generally, um, it's been understood that any quantum error correcting code obeys some version of the QES formula. Um, so also there, it's some somehow lives beyond just holographic CFTs. Um, and in particular, I want to emphasize this paper of Hayden and Pennington from 2018 about alphabets, where they showed that if you have um, a holographic CFT that's entangled with a reference system that is could be anything, does not have to be a holographic CFT, and you ask about the entanglement wedge of the reference system, uh, maybe together with some part of the CFT or not, then uh, the QES formula can still make sense, sort of basically inspired by this error correction picture. I mean, in general, the the entanglement wedge of the of of the other system can of the res, of the reference system can contain pieces of the holographic of the dual of the, the gravity region of the of the dual CFT. Um, uh, and so, so that that's kind of one way of seeing the generality of this formula through this sort of tensor network encoding kind of perspective. Um, Another way, uh, which uh, goes back, I guess, uh, to the paper of Lukowitz and Malvasena in 2013, is that by using this Euclidean replica method in, from the gravity point of view, um, you can give a rather general derivation of the QES formula, which doesn't rely on special features of ADS CFT. And you know, it's interesting when when Juan and Aitor wrote their paper, they called it generalized gravitational entropy, and they made you know, they were very careful to not talk about ADS CFT for as long as possible in the paper. And then they just presented it as an example. And I, and maybe other people at the time thought, you know, these guys are just being silly. You know, they're, they're you know, why don't they just say they're proving the RT formula? But, you know, now, you know, with the benefit of seven years of hindsight, I see that they were, they were right to phrase it the way they did because, you know, because the argument didn't need anything detailed from ADS CFT. Um, and then finally, this was really, you know, of course, came into the and came into its own last year in these amazing papers of Pennington, on Mary Engelhart, Merrill from Maxfield, where they showed that if you, you know, if you trust this sense that you should be allowed to apply the QES formula to the reservoir system, uh, then you can give a derivation of the page curve for certain evaporating black holes. Um, so, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that because it's going to be important for my argument against global symmetries, um, and maybe also this will get at Raghu's question. So, uh, so let's first remember how black holes work in in Jakiv Um So, so this green region here is kind of the dynamical region of the space time. You have two asympt asymptotically ADS boundaries here and here. Then there's some sort of unphysical region up here, which is part of the classical solution, but uh, isn't part of the Hamiltonian theory, Hamiltonian formulation of the theory. If you want to go up into here, you have to violate the boundary conditions over here, and I, we're not, I'm not going to allow the boundary conditions to be violated. Um, so the, there's a solution that looks like a black hole. So the delta delta phi is just linear. So here, this is kind of Schwarzschild coordinates, say living in the right exterior here. And then you have this Schwarzschild type metric where here T is the temperature um, of the black hole. And then if you do Euclidean gravity, you find a formula for the entropy, which looks like this. So it's uh, four pi times uh, phi naught plus two pi phi B times the temperature. Okay, so, so if you trust Euclidean gravity, then you'll conclude that the entropy of a black hole of temperature T um, with one boundary is this. Now, um, what was realized in this paper of Ahmed, Netta, Don, and Henry is that you can realize a version of the information problem for this black hole by um, coupling to a reservoir on one side and allowing the conformal matter to leak out. 
So here's what that looks like. You take this two-sided wormhole, you have the gray reservoir system over here, you turn on an interaction at t equals zero, there's some initial energy that falls in into both systems. And then this boundary sort of gradually radiates negative energy into the black hole, causing its mass to decrease on the right side and gradually radiates positive energy into the bath, um, you know, producing a Hawking cloud. Um, and so you can show that if you, uh, if you treat this theory using conical quantization, that you can compute the entropy of this radiation system as a function of time. Uh, and here's what you get. So this is kind of the uh, entropy, which you see it grows with time until it eventually, eventually separate, saturates at some large finite value. Here, T1 is the temperature of the black hole after this initial shock has gone in from, from turning on the coupling. Um, but then they observed that um, this entropy, at least if, uh, if the initial temperature prior to the shock, so that's this T naught, is large compared to this phi naught, which was this parameter appearing in the action, the topological term in the action, then eventually this formula for the entropy of the radiation exceeds um, the coarse grain entropy formula down here for the, for the entropy of the black holes, for, 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 bo for both of the two black holes. Uh, and so somehow this radiation is more entropic than it could be if it were entangled with uh, a quantum mechanical system with this entropy. Okay. Now, um, what to make of that? Well, if you just treat this theory entirely as a self-contained quantum theory of gravity constructed by conical quantization, then what you learn from this is just that the entropy formula is wrong. So this, this formula that I wrote here um, is just not the right formula for the entropy of the black holes here. Because uh, if you think about ev um, evolution on sort of nice slices that go all the way across, it's purely unitary. This really is the entropy of the radiation. And um, essentially by making this, uh, this uh, T1 big, you can uh, exceed the original, you, know, you can exceed the Euclidean entropy by an arbitrary amount. Um, so um, the way that you should think about this, is, again, like the CJHS model, is that this is just a theory with remnants. It, it produces a, a radiation entropy which goes up. And what's left behind is some object which uh, classically looks like a black hole, but its entropy exceeds that of Bekenstein and Hawking. It looks like there's a question, so I, I can take the question. There is a question by Stefano Antonini. Uh, there you go. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, is T1 the temperature of the black hole right after the shock wave? And so it doesn't take into account the back reaction of the Hawking radiation? Uh, yeah, so T1 is, the, T1 is the temperature right after the shock wave goes in. But this formula does include the back reaction. This formula is true up to very late times. So uh, you, in fact, you can reinterpret this formula by saying that T1 squared times this is really the effective temperature as a function of time. And if you if you think that if you work it through, that's the right interpretation. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Um, okay. Um, now the key point, though, is that if we instead of try instead of taking the bulk theory completely seriously, some might say too seriously, we instead only view it as a low energy effective field theory, which is UV completed into some holographic description, then we shouldn't necessarily trust this calculation of the entropy. And in particular, we might instead want to try using the quantum extremal surface formula. Um, and what was shown in these papers is that if you do that, um, then the formula is indeed changed. So instead of, so this was, this thing on the left is the formula we had before, but now it's a minimum between this and some other option here. Um, and then whichever one's smaller is the one that wins. And with this formula, you never contradict the entropy formula. So, so I think somehow this formula that. doesn't actually show up in any of the papers, but, but using the technology from the papers, this is the formula for the page curve that you get from the quantum extremal surface formula. Yeah, Tarek, you have a question? Yeah, you can unmute yourself, Tarek. Hey, uh, yeah, sorry, my, uh, maybe I'm being a bit slow, but I, could you maybe explain a little bit more why in your previous slide, the conclusion is that the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy has to be, is wrong? 
Well, it has to be because because uh, in, in when you view this as a fundamental theory, the bulk description is the fundamental theory. The radiation degrees of freedom are independent of the gravity degrees of freedom. Okay, so um, and this is the right calculation of the entropy, and if you if that's the way you think about the theory. Um, but then since this entropy gets bigger than the sum of the coarse grain entropy of the two remaining black holes, um, it just must be the case that those two black holes uh, have, have a Hilbert space which can exceed this one. And in fact, you can, you can also construct it explicitly. So if you think about this geometry, you can make states. So if you fix an energy band and you wanna count the states that can live in that energy band, this theory has no UV cutoff, it's more normalizable. So I can push modes against this horizon, CFT modes, as close as I want, as deep into the UV as I want. And in that way, I can store an arbitrary amount of information um, without costing energy. Uh, and that's kind of the definition of a remnant in some sense, is an object that can store an arbitrary large amount of energy without um, requiring en en entropy, without requiring energy. Um, so, 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 and, and that's, that's reflected in this calculation, right? Because these modes near the horizon are precisely the ones that purify this large um, entropy radiation of the radiation. Does that help? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I, I think, I think I might understand a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's all because of the renormalizability, right? So I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm allowed to trust this theory all the way into the UV and you can't stop me. Um, There's another I question see. by Juan. Yeah, hola Juan, what's up? Yeah, so I, I think I think we can interpret this differently. So the way you were defining your canonical theory, canonical quantization theory, phi yeah. not is not really a parameter because you're yeah, never nothing. Yeah, that's right. Nothing really depends on it. Yes. Uh, right, so phi not really only arises when we can change topologies, and then it's a weight that appears when you can change topologies. So I think we could say that if you do canonical quantization, it's like having phi not being infinite. So we are forbidding any change of topology. So then the entropy is also infinite, which is uh, what you are saying. Yeah, so you, you can try to, I mean, I don't mind if you want to, if you want to interpret it that way, but I don't think you have to interpret it that way, right? I mean, if I take this action with a finite phi naught and I do what's in Dirac's textbook, this is the theory that I get. Yeah, I'm just trying to, to offer, to say it in a way that there is no contradiction. So I would say that phi naught only makes sense when you can change topology. And if you don't change topology, it's equivalent to having phi naught infinite. And so the entropy is infinite and there is no contradiction with our usual discussions. Yeah, so I think maybe what you're saying is that the limit of this theory where I take phi naught to infinity it then works in the same way as we expect in higher dimensions. I, I agree with that, right? Um, right. But, but I, that doesn't mean that there's not this funny theory where you don't take it to infinity and then things work in a weird way. I don't, I don't think it's inconsistent, it's just weird. I just think phi naught is not a parameter of the the canonical theory. I mean, Wait. that's true. It, in the end, it doesn't show. It, in the end, it doesn't show up. So, but then, but then you could say it anyway. Then you can say I can pick it to be whatever value I want, since it doesn't matter, right? I mean, you want to choose it to be infinity, you know. I, I think maybe this will be a little bit more clear at the end of okay. the talk, where 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 we talk about the Euclidean okay. gravity yeah. path integral. Um, so, so this picture, I guess we've all, yeah, let me move on. So th this picture, I guess we've all seen it a million times, but let me just emphasize, right? So the idea is that you have this new quantum extremal surface gamma, which shows up at, and at late times it can be minimal. So then the entanglement wedge of the radiation. So at early times, it's just this yellow shaded region, but at late times it can also include this yellow island over here. Uh, and when it includes the yellow island over here, then this term here is this option here is what you get from the quantum extremal surface formula. And then since there was that minimum in the quantum extremal surface formula, that's what tells us that we should take whichever of these is smaller. Okay. Um, so th that, that was just, that's, that's it for my sort of review. Now let's try to use this to exclude global symmetries. Um, so let's first remember how the argument went in my paper with Hiroshi. So the, the paper was 180 pages long, but in fact, you can just do it on the slides. So let's do it on a slide. Um, 
So the idea is you, you take the boundaries here. And so th these are two options. So you can think about it either like this picture or like that picture. Let's start first with the left picture. So you just split the boundary up into regions. Um, uh, and then you assume that you have an operator in the middle of the bulk, say this green dot here, which is charged under the global symmetry. So if you have a global symmetry, you have to have something that's charged under the global symmetry. Otherwise, it's not much of a symmetry. Okay. So then the idea is by splitting the boundary up into enough regions, we can arrange so that a state where we have the charged uh, sitting in, a, in the region, which is not in the entanglement wedge of any one of these regions. Okay. By adding more regions, I can always achieve that. Uh, and over here, I've done the same thing, but I've just done it with the wormhole so that I can allow the regions to be each be separate asymptotic boundaries. But it's the same idea. Now, the key point is that by boundary locality, um, the unitary operator that implements the symmetry on, on the Hilbert space has to split up into a project, a product of operators, uh, one which lives on this region, one which lives on this region, one which lives on this region. Um, if you like, this is essentially, essentially Neuther's theorem um, in the continuous case, although this statement also applies for discrete symmetries. Um, but then you're clearly going to get a contradiction because um, this since this green operator isn't in the entanglement wedge of any one of these regions, um, it has to commute with any operator that has support only on these regions. Um, at least if it's an operator that has a reasonable low energy interpretation as these do. Um, and therefore it has to commute with all of the pieces of this operator, but therefore it has to commute with this operator too. So it, it couldn't have been charged in the first place. Okay, so that's our contradiction somehow just uh, you know, global symmetry in the bulk is not compatible with the locality of the boundary theory because that locality requires the global symmetry to split up into pieces, each of which can't reach the charged operator to tell it to transform. Okay. Um, now, sorry, Dan, this, question. Yeah, go ahead. Does this apply also if the the object is not like a low energy field, but something more complicated, like something of dimension n squared? Yeah, I think it does. So that was why I drew the green circles kind of big. So this is one of the subtleties that I didn't get into in what I just said. But um, as long as you assume that the objects that are charged have some finite size, then you can always pick these regions small enough that they'll avoid it. So for example, even if the only operators that are charged are big ADS black holes, um, you know, there'll be some, those still have some finite mass. And, uh, and I can split these R's up into small enough pieces that their entanglement wedges will still avoid that big object. Um, in fact, the same, you can play the same game over here with the wormhole by adding more boundaries, although it's not obvious. Yeah. Um, Karen so. Fernandez has a question. Yeah, there's other questions. Yeah. Uh, Karan, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, yeah. Is there anything that rules out uh, non-local uh, operators from being described in this, like in the sense of a smeared operator in the, uh, like this seems to just rule out local operators in the bulk. Well, but the definition of the, so, okay. So here, when I say global symmetry, I mean what's called a zero form global symmetry, which by definition is a global symmetry that acts on local operators. In quantum gravity, Hiroshi and I generalized that a little bit to allow it to act on, on black holes, but they have to be black holes that ultimately have some, fine, they can be local localized in space. They have some maybe large but finite size. Um, if you want to talk about a symmetry that acts on extended objects, those are what are called higher form global symmetries. And, and we can exclude those too, but you have to think a little bit harder than just this. Essentially, you have to wrap them on something and then dimensionally reduce to this picture. And there's another question by Stefano. Yeah, please unmute yourself. Um. I want to know if you consider observables in the bulk that are gravitationally dressed and they're dressed in some way by some, I don't know, the boundary or something like that. Assume that to be the kind of observable. Can you use this argument anyway? Because that dressing doesn't depend on the global charge or something like that? Yeah, that's right. So, th so this dashed lines here in the pictures are supposed to represent the gravitational dressing. So I, I drew it, I just didn't uh, explain it. And then yes, basically we, we have to argue that um, just knowing the gravitational dressing is not sufficient to know um, the charge of the particle. Uh, so we discuss it in some length in the paper. I mean, roughly speaking, the idea is that, you know, just if I tell you that something is a Lorentz scalar, 
that doesn't that like that's not enough to tell you it's global charge because for example I could multiply two of them together and I still have another Lorentz scalar. So just the Lorentz representation isn't good enough. Um, All right, um, I suggest we uh, sort of uh, yeah. let so, Daniel go on because I'm going to give you also the five minute warning for now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so to extend this beyond ADO CFT, we need a few assumptions. So. So let's, so here, now, let S be some quantum gravity system which has black hole solutions um, with a semi-classical description living in D dimensions. Um, and let R be a reservoir system um, consisting of weakly interacting quantum fields on RD, possibly including linearized gravitons. So then here are the assumptions that I'm gonna make. So first, we can couple R and S together such that a pure state black hole in S um, produces Hawking radiation, which is then gradually transferred to R, okay? Um, two, uh, we can compute the fine grain entropy of S and also of subregions of R using the QES formula. Uh, and so this is the, this is the main assumption here. Uh, and then finally, that um, the coupling between R and S preserves any global symmetries of S. Um, and moreover, uh, their action can be extended locally to R. Okay. So these are a bit technical. Roughly speaking, you should just think of this S as a black hole, R as its Hawking radiation. I'm just trying to state a little bit more clearly the properties of these, which the argument is actually going to use. Um, okay. Now with these assumptions, actually, it's the, it's a, this argument is basically a one-liner because um, we just have the same contradiction. So we take our black, so this red dot here is our quantum gravity system S. This red line is the reservoir system here. Uh, we just evolve for a while until the black hole has evaporated enough that the entanglement wedge of the reservoir system contains this yellow island over here, okay? Um, just as we saw in Jakeef Teitelboim before. This, this pink region here is the entanglement wedge of the quantum gravity system here, S. Uh, and so then, uh, since we uh, assume that we could arrange for the global symmetry to act locally on the radiation, that means that the, so the full global symmetry acts both on S and on R, but by locality, we can split it up into a piece that acts on S, a piece that acts on this part of the radiation, a piece which acts on this part, a piece which acts on this part, and so on. Um, and, uh, and moreover, by, by making these pieces small enough, we can arrange that the entanglement wedge of each piece of the radiation does not contain this island. Okay, so the, the entanglement wedge of all of them does, but the entanglement wedge of any piece doesn't, and then also the entanglement wedge of S also doesn't contain this region. Um, but then we just have the same contradiction, right? We put a charged operator here in the island, this green dot, um, and uh, well, actually it can't be charged because it has to commute with all of the pieces of the symmetry operator, so it has to be neutral. Um, so it's the same contradiction as before. We've just, uh, we've taken the figure here and we've replaced this white region in the center by the island and we've replaced these Rs by pieces of the Hawking radiation, or I could say the same thing here. And in fact, this was the same replacement that uh, Chris Akers and Netta and I used last year as an analogy to these page curve calculations. Here, we're kind of running the analogy in the other direction so that we can apply my argument with Hiroshi directly to the evaporating black hole. Um, okay, I just wanna mention there was an interesting paper uh, last week showing that by uh, Henry Lin and uh, Yiming Chen showing that you can quantify this contradiction by studying the relative entropy uh, of the symmetry transformed version of the state on the radiation to the state on the radiation by itself. So this should, they show should vanish if there's a unbroken global symmetry, but it can't because this U of G and R can't actually implement the symmetry on the island, which uh, destroys the argument that this should be zero. Um, and so, so it's kind of the same contradiction, but here they give you a thing to compute. So you can kind of see how, how badly, you know, the contradiction is realized. And they have some nice wormhole picture where you, where you, for interpreting the, the non-vanishing of this. Um, okay, so I wanna close with some comments on Euclidean gravity. Um, so I wanna now return to this question of the validity of Euclidean quantum gravity, which, um, well, we saw it gave the wrong answer for the entropy um, in the case where we did canonical quantization. Um, but you know, it gives the right answer when we think of the theory as an effective theory, which is the low energy limit of a holographic theory. Um, so I'm gonna promote this to a general conjecture. So where I say the Euclidean gravity path integral um, and some gravitational effective field theory with the quantum mechanical UV completion 
um, correctly computes von Neumann entropies if and only if um, the UV completion is holographic, uh, in which case it's really computing the entropies of the holographic theory. Um, so in other words, Euclidean gravity and holography are in some sense equivalent. Um, so to motivate this, let's remember that in quantum field theory, the path integral representation of the trace always lives on a space of the form of a circle times some spatial manifold. Um, and that's true for canonically quantized gravity as well. Um, although uh, then you have to possibly sum over appropriate spatial topologies. Um, but there's a simple argument by Hawking that no uh, spatial, to, no topology, no, no space time with topology S1 times sigma can ever give you an entropy which is of order one over G. Uh, and it's a pretty simple argument. You just, you know, as, at least as long as time translation symmetry around the circle is unbroken, then the Euclidean action has to be proportional to beta. Um, and so at, at leading order in one over G, if you compute the entropy, well, you see if log Z is linear in beta, this just gives zero. Okay. So somehow the first non-trivial contribution to this entropy from any geometry with this topology has to be order one and not order one over G. Um, so that kind of shows you that canonical quantization is never going to give you the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, at least not canonical quantization of the bulk variables. Okay. Now the standard fix for this is that you also allow Euclidean geometries which don't have this form. Um, in particular, you only require that the boundary topology has the circle, uh, and then you allow the circle to contract in the bulk. Um, so like in this, for example, and then you sum, right? So here's some Euclidean geometry where the thermal circle doesn't contract, but this dashed line indicates there's some other cycle that contracts. Um, whereas like this is like the Schwarzschild geometry where the thermal circle contracts, and it was shown by Gibbons and Hawking um, that if you include this geometry, then you get S equals A over 4G and it's great. Um, but on the other hand, why are we allowed to include this geometry on the right, right? I mean, if it, you know, if it doesn't come out of the standard way of deriving the Euclidean path integral, then who are we to add it? Okay. Well, in holography, there's kind of a natural reason why we should add it, which is that since the microscopic description lives at the asymptotic boundary, that's also where the real thermal circle lives. So away from the boundary, there's no particular reason to prevent the S1 from contracting. And in fact, in ADS-CFT, if we don't allow it to contract, then we get the wrong high temperature density of states of the dual CFT. Um, this is still a little mysterious though, because you can think how can mere low energy effective field theory have access to you know, deep non-perturbative information about quantum gravity? Well, I don't have a full answer for how it can know, but I just wanna close by making one comment. So in ADS CFT, we can say a little bit more, which is that from the boundary point of view, um, you often have high temperature, low temperature duality um, uh, sometimes called modular invariance in one plus one dimensions, um, which uh, from the bulk point of view relates geometries where the thermal circle contracts to geometries where it doesn't, okay? Um, and so for ADS3, that's very well understood. There's this paper of Strominger using the Cardi formula. And then my collaborator, Edgar, has been studying this in higher dimensions uh, in great detail. And there's a similar story there. Um, so uh, we do expect gravitational effective field theory should be able to compute the partition function on a space time where the thermal circle doesn't contract, for example, like a thermal ADS. Um, and so then this duality ensures that we can repurpose that to also give a reliable computation of the high temperature density of states within the low energy bulk theory. Um, now, so from this point of view, um, you can think of the Euclidean gravity path integral as restoring the minimal amount of UV information which is necessary to preserve this high temperature, low temperature duality, um, kind of removing the separate treatment of the spatial circle and the temporal circle that we got from canonical quantization in the bulk. Um, and apparently this sort of minimal amount of UV information from the Euclidean path integral is also sufficient to determine the entropy in the pH curve and apparently also to forbid global symmetry. Um, so I think that's where I'll stop with this idea that you should really think of the UV path, of the Euclidean path integral as providing UV input um, into what you would have obtained just from trying to quantize the bulk by itself. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Now with this new uh, with this new Zoom, we can all put little uh, hand clapping emojis. Uh, we have time for uh, a few questions. So questions. So maybe I can start with one. Um, so if we are to exclude uh, global symmetries, but that they are sort of um, 
they, they're looking like they could exist in low in the low energy EFT, but they're really gate potentially gauged. Um, can we quantify that? Can we say like at yeah, one yeah. So, scale they become gauged? I think that's an important question. And I think this paper by Henry and Yiming um, is I would say the first thing I know that tries to do that. Um, they don't go the whole distance, uh, but they at least, yeah, be essentially because the, the, the violation that they show still requires some black hole in order to see it. Um, what you would really want to know is like, you know, say just in particle physics, right? Like, so some low energy correlator, what's the, what's the lower bound on, on global symmetry violation? Um, yeah. And I don't currently see how to get that. On the other hand, you know, the symmetry violation, which they find here, which is, you know, it's again, it's basically coming from the same effect I'm talking about here, but here they here it's quantified. Um, you could hope to kind of turn that into some sort of bound on, you know, particle symmetry, particle physics symmetry violation or the range of the inflaton or something like that, but definitely it hasn't happened yet. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a next question by Matt Hedrick. Um, yeah, please unmute yourself, Matt. Hi. Um, uh, whoops. Yeah, um, my question actually is about this slide that you're showing right now and about the um, uh, vertical dashed line. So yeah. in trying to generalize your ADS argument away from ADS, you've assumed that you can couple your quantum gravity theory at some finite distance to some other non-gravitational theory. Yeah. And I'm just to what extent, I mean, of course, in ADS, we, we know that we can do that um, yeah. uh, because on the boundary, we have a local quantum field theory. But to what extent do we know whether in a general quantum gravity theory, you're allowed to put it in a finite box? Right. So it's, it's a bit heuristic. And I would say this is a complaint that can be made also about the page curve calculations in general. Right. I mean, to the extent that we think that the mechanism which happens in these calculations should hold you know, for evaporating black holes in flat space. We somehow have to think that, you know, far away from the black hole, we can kind of make an arbitrary split into the radiation, the region mm -hmm. containing the Hawking radiation, where everything is, you know, weakly curved and semi-classical and should be described by the Fox space of uh, of the Hawking radiation, and the region right around the black hole, where uh, you know we have to confront full quantum gravity to understand it quantum mechanically. So yeah. I, I was trying to think about it like that. So roughly speaking, you know, make a, you know, draw a big sphere around the black hole, you know, at some large but finite radius. And then just, uh, I'm imagining that uh, we can, so there it won't be perfect, but you know, to enough precision, we can split that we can run this argument. Um, and you know that's that's imperfect, and uh, that's also an issue for arguing that this page curve calculation works in Minkowski space. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think it would be important to think that through more carefully. My my guess is that this decomposition will not be quite precise. And then, by the way, that's also why I allowed for linearized gravity in the in the in the reservoir mm -hmm. is because I wanted to think of you know I mean and a real black hole most of you know a lot of its radiation is gravitons right. So, and so if I want to apply this argument to there, then I have to allow for that. Um, but yeah, is it really consistent? I mean, probably not quite, but I think there's probably some approximation scheme where, where this is a valid, uh, you know, sort of leading picture of what's going on. I see, okay, all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, maybe a quick question by Henry and then we should uh, start testing the, the discussion. So go ahead quickly, Henry. And then mute yourself. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Yeah, um, uh, Daniel, you said early on a comment about um, about a, sort of a unique solution to this quantum mechanics being uh, essentially sort of ads -CFT, holographic. I can't remember what the exact statement was, <laughs> but um, it yeah. was. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, only compatible with quantum mechanics. So I was wondering why uh, something like JT isn't uh, consistent with that. Okay, it's not a quantum mechanics where the uh, Hilbert space of the n boundary Hilbert space isn't a tensor product of n one boundary Hilbert spaces. But there's no reason if you didn't know about ADS CFT, that wouldn't be something you'd expect anyway. Yeah. So, so I'm wondering I why that's well. So by 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 JT, you mean the Euclidean quote quantization of JT. Yes. Um, so, so here, uh, I didn't. My, this statement doesn't preclude the idea that the Euclidean 
path integral could have some meaning other than that's not quantum mechanical, right? So that's why I put compatible with yeah. quantum mechanics. So well, this I, is, yeah, this is what I'm objecting about is that's perfectly consistent with quantum mechanics, just that the Hilbert space of an end, the end boundary Hilbert space is not the tensor product of one boundary. I thought, space, I thought it's, but it's not, a perfectly ordinary quantum mechanics. Aren't you supposed to be averaging in that theory? Well, from the boundary point of view, it looks like an average, but from the point of view of the gravitational system, that is just because there's some Hilbert space of closed universes you didn't know about. So it's from just from the, the bulk point of view, it's a perfectly, it's in the same sort of status as your two boundary JT without topology change in the, it makes. Yeah. Well, I don't see uh, how whether it's quantum mechanics or not can depend on, uh, on which side of the dual variables we prefer. I mean, either it is or it isn't, right? Sure. Or another way of saying it is that the the uh, another alternative way of describing an ensemble is just that you've got a Hamiltonian that is block diagonal, and each block is one member of the ensemble. Um, but it's perfectly ordinary quantum mechanics. It's sorry. I mean, maybe, to me, there's a big difference between averaging and not averaging, which is what we call quenched versus annealed disorder, and it has to do with when you compute observables, do you average, you know, sort of before or after. You, for example, you take the logarithms of things. I, I, I'm not sure I've completely understood what you're saying, but I, I don't think you can have your cake and eat it too. You either obey quantum mechanics or you don't, right? All right, I'm going to have to sorry. cut the discussion short. I'm sorry, guys, but um, in order to- We're going to talk about this for another hour anyway, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> okay, right. so, uh, let's, let's, anyway. I'll thank Daniel again. Um, and uh, yes, please uh, continue the discussion um, also on Slack. So uh, maybe I can ask uh, now uh, Douglas, uh, Steve, and Raphael to, I guess, turn on their videos. And maybe we can just start by testing the screen sharing for Douglas. If you're there, Douglas, and you can hear me. Hi. Did, um, yeah, let me try. <clears throat> That. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I don't know in which order you guys had planned to go. Maybe Douglas should go first. All right. Sounds good. Well, okay, sure. I'll leave it. It's up to you guys. So, um, all right. So let me 